Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q&A for A Ballad for Dead Children, the amazing documentary that you just watched. I'm Gwen Callahan. I'm the co-director of the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, and I'm thrilled today. I'm joined by Jorge Navas, the director and writer of the documentary, and also by Rosario Caicedo, who is Andres Caicedo's sister and who helped a lot with the documentary. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for having us here. Uh, <laughs> we feel very honored and especially just being part of this uh, festival with the name of H.P. Lovecraft, which, uh, you know, the name itself says a lot about an yes. author that Andres just adored. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yes, he was a big fan. And I feel that after this, I hope that all of the Lovecraft fans that are watching and anyone else who might see this goes and finds all of Andres's work to read them because um, I think it's important that we know other than in just the United States and Europe that there are other countries where Lovecraft's influence is felt and he inspired so many other writers that we are kind of learning about as things on the internet pop up and we you know it becomes we become a more global community of um cosmic horror fans um so i think that's really great and i hope that by showing this documentary everywhere that more people will become aware of Andres and his work. So um, <clears throat> my first question is for Jorge, what prompted you to make this documentary? Because um, in my just very brief research on the internet, it looks like uh, Luis Ospina, who is in the documentary that you've made, also made a documentary in 1986 um, about Andres, and I'm guessing maybe it was a different angle for it. So I was just curious, like what what drove you to make this documentary? Okay, I'm going to speak in Spanish and Rosario is going to translate me, no? Um, Andres Caicedo es un escritor colombiano de los años 70s, eh, que murió en los años 70s, eh, se quitó la vida a los 25 años, y era muy conocido porque fue un cronista de su época en Colombia, en Cali, que hablaba de la salsa, que hablaba eh, de la juventud, pero había una faceta que era muy desconocida, que era su relación con el, con el horror, con el cine de terror, con la serie B, con el cine de zombies. Ok, we're going to, we're going to stop right there. <laughs> ok, and I'm going to translate for Jorge. Um, uh, he said that Andres uh, was a person, a writer, very young, who began writing uh, when he was 15 years old, basically. And he uh, began to write uh, about many things. And uh, he's known, he, he killed himself at age 25. So there are 10 years in which his production was quite active. So he was known basically for his first novel, Que Viva La Musica, but there is a phase, there is a part of Andres Caicedo that was not so well known by so many people, which is his fascination with horror in general and with the Gothic horror. So that's what Jorge is beginning to say. Y él empezó una tendencia eh, o fue la base de la piedra angular de un subgénero cinematográfico en Colombia y en Cali que se llamó el gótico tropical, que básicamente okay. el gótico tropical utiliza los arquetipos del gótico inglés y los traslada al tercer mundo, a Colombia, a Cali, a la, al sudor, a la, sed, a, a, a la vegetación, a la, a, a la música salsa y desde allí empieza a construir una nueva mitología. Um, and Andres, in a way, was the person who originated uh, through his literature what came to be known 
as el gótico tropical, tropical gothic. Um, many people felt and still feel that gothic as a genre is basically for Anglo-Saxon cultures. But in Andres, he basically was the one that brought that Gothic influence, the influence of the English Gothic into the tropics through his short stories and his literature. So that is very important to say. Y era muy extraño que un joven en los años 70 conociera a Lovecraft en Colombia, en Latinoamérica, en ese momento, que aparte hiciera un guión, una adaptación de, un, de, un, de una novela de Lovecraft y de un cuento de, de ¿cómo se llama? Ashton... Clark. ¿Cómo se llama? Uh, Ashton, Clark. ¿Cómo? Clark Ashton Smith. Clark Ashton Smith, eh, de la estirpe de la cripta. Era muy extraño que hiciera unas adaptaciones para cine y que viajara a Los Ángeles a buscar a Roger Corman para venderle estas historias y estas películas, ¿no? Era, era, era un personaje muy bizarro y extraño para su momento, en un momento donde el boom de literatura latinoamericana eh, y el realismo mágico era lo que mandaba en ese momento como las tendencias, ¿no? Entonces, mientras en Colombia había un realismo mágico con Gabriel García Márquez, por el otro lado estaba Andrés Caicedo con un, uh, tratando de adaptar a H.P. Lovecraft y eso era bastante loco para nuestra sociedad. Ok, so what Jorge is saying is that what is very important to see in Andrés was that he was writing at the end of the 60s and the past century and the beginning of the 70s and it was quite unusual and strange and even bizarre that such a young man in a very provincial city like Cali would know so much about H.P. Lovecraft. If mm H.P. -hmm. Lovecraft is like a cult writer here in the United States, well, it was basically unknown in Colombia. So it's quite interesting and almost bizarre, as I said, to imagine such a young person, an adolescent, basically, getting mm -hmm. uh, so interested in in the bizarre part of Lovecraft. And not only that, but trying to get his short stories and his novels produced and written into scripts, movie scripts, that he felt he could travel to the United States, to Hollywood, and sell them to Roger Corman, the famous B-movie director, uh, he was convinced that he could do that. He, y, so he, he dreamed very big. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was thinking uh, quite big, almost in a delusional way, should I say, you know? I mean, imagine if it's difficult now to sell a script in Hollywood, what it meant in 1973 to sell a script in Hollywood at that time. And the contrast with the real, magic realism, uh, you exactly. don't speak about it. Exactly. And uh, that, that was something that I, I, I should have said. The other thing is that Andres was writing um, in, in a style that was so completely different from the style of Latin American literature at that time, which was so concentrated on what is called el realismo mágico, García Márquez, and everybody that belonged to the Latin American boom. So he went, he went his own way. Y al, y al mismo tiempo, ya para terminar esta pregunta, él, util, él era un, un escritor que todo lo que hacía lo relacionaba mucho con su vida personal, con su biografía. Y utilizó a Lovecraft y a, y a Smith para, de alguna manera, adaptar las historias de ellos, pero también hablar de cosas muy personales y fusionó eso en, de una manera muy única y muy, sí, muy personal. Uh, the other thing that interested Jorge was that he uh, took Lovecraft's ideas and Lovecraft's work and not only used it 
as a literary uh, way of being influenced by it, but he also got into that part of Lovecraft, his own personal biography and his own personal history. So uh, it, it is quite fascinating to see how he combined those two things. Uh -huh. That is interesting. There's a lot of writers writing today that um, have taken elements or themes from Lovecraft's writing and brought it, you know, brought their own spin to it. But it's a, it seems like Andres was one of the first sort of contemporary authors to really combine, you know, Lovecraft's themes and style and um, elements of his writing with his own um, biographical, like very personal, making it making it modern and um, rather than something over there, it's something right here. Exactly, exactly. And I have to say, um, perdona Jorge, voy, a, voy a, a decir algo con respecto a lo que acaba de decir Gwen. Um, I just wanted I just wanted to say something that is different from what Jorge is saying or adding to what Jorge uh, is saying that what is really fascinating about Andres's work regarding his influence with Lovecraft is that he was basically a trailblazer. You know, I mean, I haven't done all the research that should be done about who was the first Latin American writer who got Lovecraft into the Latin American uh, uh, imaginario, you know, I mean, the literature, et cetera. But I would dare to say that Andres maybe was one of the first ones, and especially at yeah. such a young age, that he had such a knowledge of, the, of, of uh, Lovecraft's writing. It's interesting too, um, we've been doing some, a little bit of research on film, like Lovecraft adaptations to film. And as far as we can tell, the first um, film adaptation of a Lovecraft story was from Mexico um, in, I think, 1963, 1963, okay. 19, I'm sorry, Brian's over there giving me notes, but um, it was La, La Marca del Muerto. Wow. And it was, uh, wow. Sort of an adaptation of um, Charles Dexter Ward. Oh, and God. then so 1960, and then 1968, I think was uh, the Haunted Palace. Oh no, I'm sorry. So that was Haunted Palace in 1963. So three years later, Roger Corman made exactly. Edgar Allan Poe's The Haunted Palace, which was exactly. actually an adaptation of the case of Charles Dexter Ward. So okay. it's it's interesting to us. We wonder if. Corman was aware of that adaptation or, or not, because the way films were distributed back then is much different from how it is now. Well, so it's please. possible he wasn't aware of it at all. Um, but then it's then with um, Andres writing as a, you know, 15, 15 years old to 25 years old, right after that, um, in kind of the same time period, being influenced by Lovecraft. Um, it's really interesting how we find these little pockets of influence, like where someone discovers Lovecraft, but then there's two other people who discovered yeah. Lovecraft and independently are exactly. working from that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That that is fascinating. Era muy, difícil, era muy difícil encontrar los libros en Cali, Colombia de Lovecraft, ¿no? En esa época no sabemos de dónde. Él consiguió esos libros, ¿cómo accedió a, ese, a, esa, a esa literatura? Um, uh, Jorge is saying that it was incredibly difficult in Cali, Colombia in 1965 to read the literature of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, we don't even know. That's the mystery. And I've always said that to Jorge. Jorge is not saying that. That to me, if, if, if I would have a question for Andres, the dead person right now, if I could talk to him, that's what I would ask him. I would say, where did you get such an enormous amount of literary knowledge at such a young age 
in a city that was incredibly provincial that basically did not have public libraries to be, you know, uh, to be exact. So that is a mystery that Jorge felt very much that was a mystery and that I have always felt. How in the world, when he talked to me about H.P. Lovecraft, I had no idea, no idea who he was. And I was terrified by what he showed me. <laughs> um, and Jorge, when you, when you, so what you've decided to make this documentary about um, Andres who, um, you know, no, nobody here, and very few people I think in the US um, know about him. Um, and there's, you had, so how did you meet Rosario? Uh, la, nos encontramos porque me invitaron a hacer este documental, un canal de televisión de Colombia me invitó a hacer el documental sobre Andrés Caicedo, pero sobre su parte más conocida que es sobre la música salsa, sobre que viva la música, que es la novela más importante que él tiene, es como una crónica de, 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 de Cali de los años 70 que gira alrededor de la salsa, el rock and roll y las drogas, eh, pero yo propuse que lo hiciéramos eh, desde otro lado el documental, que era este lado como más relacionado con el gótico tropical, con la oscuridad, con la tragedia y con el destino, que eran temas muy importantes para Andrés Caicedo y que se amarraban eh, pues como con esta, con esta idea del terror, ¿no? Entonces, eh, en la investigación eh, nos conectamos y nos volvimos muy amigos. Yo viajé a, a, a visitar a Rosario, Estados Unidos. Incluso fuimos a la tumba de H.P. Lovecraft a visitarla, a visitar la tumba. Eh, y pues sería muy interesante que Rosario te, nos contara también como esa relación que Andrés Caicedo tuvo cuando fue a New England a conocer como toda la zona eh, eh, que hicimos ese mismo recorrido. Entonces, digamos que nos conocimos por el documental, básicamente, y de ahí en adelante ha surgido como una gran amistad. Um, uh, Jorge said that we, we met, basically, uh, personally, uh, through uh, the fact that Jorge uh, was given by a... Uh, a TV channel in Colombia, uh, the possibility of working on a documentary on Andres Caicedo. There were many other documentaries at that time. Uh, I have to add, Jorge, that what we have to say is that you had already made uh, a film on Andres in 1997 called Cali Calabozo. Uh, so Jorge was quite fascinated by Andres even before. But I had seen that documentary, Cali Calabozo, but I had never met Jorge personally. So through what Jorge wanted to do with this documentary was something very different from what the TV station wanted. Uh, he did not want to concentrate the documentary on Andres Caicedo, the author of Que Viva La Musica, uh, which is the novel that is iconic in Colombia at this point, and that he wrote it um, when he, uh, actually he began writing it when he came to the United States to sell the famous delusional uh, plan of selling the, the scripts to Roger Corman and finished it in 1975 and published it in 1977. Um, but Jorge wanted to lead this documentary into another aspect of Andres, which was the Gothic Andres, the tragic Andres, uh, the Andres fascinated by the horror, that if you read his short stories and even his film criticism, you find that horror in those stories. So Jorge wanted to concentrate on that. And through that aspect, we met in Bogota in 2000, um, 2014, I believe, Jorge, or 2015? 15. Uh, 2015, we met in Bogota and we began to talk. Uh, and, and I was fascinated by what, by what Jorge wanted to do because that is something that I'm very aware 
uh, when I think of my brother's life, uh, my brother's literary life and my brother's personal life. So we became very good friends and we had developed through uh, the written word and the movies, a wonderful friendship. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, so <Yeah>. I, <laughs> it's like um, an epistolary friendship when yeah. letters are not written anymore, you know? <laughs> so we we developed, we developed that and then we met and uh, and we're very, very close right now. HP Lovecraft would approve. <laughs> yes. And I think that Andres, Andres would have approved too. <laughs> We, we say the art of letter writing is dead, but um, but you two have carried it on, <laughs> maintained it. In a different way, but it's, it's a different way of writing letters. Uh -huh. when, so when did you start really making the documentary in earnest? When? When? Um, when? 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 Yeah, when? 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 Um, five six years ago you came you came to my house i i live in connecticut so i live in new england uh and um and of course is is the the land of of uh of hp lovecraft you know i mean we're very close to to where he lived in in rhode island uh in in providence and uh we visited the the cemetery and that was quite a trip. <laughs> uh, but um you came in 2017, Jorge. Okay. You came in 2017. Six years ago. Six years ago. Yeah. Six years ago. Okay. Yes. Um and then you but you finished in 2020. 2020, yes. So it so was, it was Around four years, around four years you spent making the yes, documentary. Exactly. Yes. Eh, fue, fue muy interesante porque la película se terminó en el 2020, en el 2020, que fue la, el, y se estrenó en Cartagena, en el Festival de Cine de Cartagena, que es una ciudad colombiana que queda al lado del mar, un cine que queda al lado del mar, eh, como en un malecón, y ese día iba a ir Roger Corman a ver la película porque estaba invitado al Festival de Cine de Cartagena, eh, pero no pudo llegar porque se cerraron los aeropuertos porque fue el día que empezó la pandemia mundial, que se declaró pandemia mundial. Entonces fue muy interesante que esta película que habla de Lovecraft, que habla de Lovecraft, del horror, Roger Corman, eh, que se haya, no se haya podido, que se, que se haya bloqueado el festival y se bloquearon todas las ventanas de la película porque empezó una pandemia, ¿no? Que era como una historia de terror real en el mundo real de, de, de lo que estaba sucediendo. Um, uh, the, it took basically from 2017 to 2020 for Jorge to finish the documentary. So by 2020, the documentary was ready, Balada para Niños Muertos, uh, was ready to be shown at the International Movie Festival in Cartagena. And on March 13, on a Friday, Friday the 13th, was ready the whole thing to be shown. And then what happens? Everybody was very excited because Roger Corman, who is in his 90s and was in his maybe 90s at that time, was going to come to the movie festival as a guest. So we were all very excited to imagine that finally Roger Corman was going to see this tale of this young artist fascinated to meet him many, many decades ago. But then what happens to follow Andres's kind of path, Gothic past and H.P. Lovecraft Gothic past, the pandemic is declared that day. And when the movie is shown, after the movie is shown, the whole festival is closed and absolutely everything in the world is closed right after the movie is shown. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It's a very, it's a sort of gothic tale into itself. <laughs> <laughs> I remember 
um, I remember that weekend because we were in New Orleans at a friend's wedding. Wow. And it was the, the last wedding that happened in New Orleans that year. <laughs> They pulled all the rest of the permits and everything closed. So yes. <laughs> um, it was very eerie, very quiet in the French Quarter and uh, spooky. Yes, yes. <laughs> incredible, In incredible. Yes, I remember when when um, everybody was talking about the pandemic before, you know, everybody, I mean, people were kind of aware that something was coming, you know, I mean, it was like the plague, the plague, the plague. <laughs> But then, then you see it in reality, you know? And when Jorge called me to tell me that the festival was closed Friday the 13th, right after this movie oh. show, I just said, oh my God, H.P. Lovecraft and Andres must be sort of dancing together somewhere, you know? <laughs> because it, it was like, it was like a, a, a horror story, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so I have a, another question about the, just the logistics of making the documentary. Was it difficult to find um, Andre, friends of Andres who could um, talk about their stories like um, uh, Ramiro Arbelez and Jamie Acosta, Oscar Campo, um, friends of his that were still alive? No, no fue difícil encontrarlos. Andrés Caicedo es un escritor muy importante en Colombia. Yo siempre digo que hay una moneda de los escritores más importantes. En, 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 por un lado está Gabriel García Márquez y por la contraparte está Andrés Caicedo, como, como para mí eh, el segundo escritor más importante en Colombia en la historia. Eh, mientras uno hacía realismo mágico, este hacía... No sé, era más punk, era más callejero, era más rudo y, y hablaba del terror, ¿no? Eh, entonces, y, y tuvo un círculo de amigos muy pocos, pero muy buenos amigos que, que, que siguieron un poco su tradición y que han alimentado como toda, toda su... como que han recuperado su obra y han recuperado como todo el valor de su obra y, han estado, y, han, y, y se han vuelto muy fuertes y han sido cineastas importantes... Entonces realmente no fue difícil encontrarlos a ellos, eh, ya como que hay toda una mitología y hay todo un universo alrededor de Andrés Caicedo y son amigos y eran conocidos y son de mi ciudad, entonces como que fue fácil hablar con ellos. Uh, it wasn't difficult at all, because um, Andrés, Andrés Caicedo is maybe the, the second most important writer. Uh, in Colombia, you know, I mean, apart from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Andres, who writes in a very different way, is is so well known in Colombia, and his friends is still not all of them. He didn't have an enormous amount of friends, but his, as he called them, unos pocos buenos amigos, because he said, uh, you know, I mean, you have to, what is it? I'm going to translate it. Uh, Uh, that was his motto. Dejar obra, morir tranquilo, y dejar unos pocos buenos amigos. If right before you die, you're going to have to write, leave your work, and leave behind a few good friends. That's what he said, and that's what he wrote. And those few good friends, right from the beginning of his death, began to protect his work and uh, they live in Cali. Lots of them live in Cali, not all of them, but they're around, you know, and they are well known because lots of them became and were before uh, filmmakers and writers. So, and Jorge is a filmmaker and a writer. And of course he knew them. So it was, it, it was very, it was very easy, that part. Okay. Very nice. Um, it's really wonderful to see all the archival footage and the clips that you use from uh, like Luis's films and um, your own films that really just uh, bring bring the story to life. So I really appreciate that you had all that available to you. And then the scenes with Luis where he's showing the posters from the, um, the cinema club were yes. really fun. <laughs> 
Um, let's see. I'm just making sure I'm, I ask all the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, that's, 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 um, um, I just wanted to ask about this. The cinema of Colombia is not that well known here in America, like the United States. I think we are so American centric, you know, like everything is like Hollywood or maybe some things from Europe or Sweden or now Japan and Korea. Um, but South South America, Latin America is not that well known here. So um, when I was looking at the film credits for the clips in the in the end of the credits where it says, um, you know, the clips from all the different films, I was like, oh, these are things I've never heard of before. And I feel like we should know about these things. And I wanted to ask Jorge, do you have a suggestion of if people are if people are interested in Andres Casero's work, is there a couple of films you would recommend for people to watch so that they get more of a feeling for the Colombian style of literature and art? Claro, eh, Andres Caicedo fue la piedra angular de un grupo que se llamó el Grupo de Cali. Y el grupo de Cali fue el que se inventó este concepto del gótico tropical, donde se mezcló literatura y cine. La parte literaria la puso Andrés Caicedo y fue y ayudó a escribir los guiones o las, las semillas de los guiones de tres películas que, que son como el, eh, el, la columna vertebral de ese movimiento, que son Pura Sangre, de Luis Ospina, eh, Carne de tu Carne, de Carlos Mayolo, y La mansión de Araucaima de Carlos Mayolo. Esas tres películas son como las tres películas importantes de ese movimiento de los años ochentas eh, que Andrés Caicedo ayudó a construir eh, después de su muerte. Exacto. Um... Y Noches sin Fortuna, que es la novela más Lovecraftiana de Andrés Caicedo, eh, yeah. sería la, el complemento literario. Uh, um, what, um, what Jorge says is that Andrés was the central piece of a movement that was called, that is called El Grupo de Cali, Cali's group. Cali's group was formed uh, by people who wrote and people who made movies, um, filmmakers and writers. Andres, after, I would say, after his death, was in a way more influential in that group that during the time that he was living. Uh, and he contributed with his literature and with scripts that he wrote, he began to write for three movies that were made after Andres died. He contributed to those scripts uh, because he was very good friends with Carlos Mayolo and Luis Ospina. So, Jorge, tell me again, dime de nuevo las tres películas. Pura Sangre. Pura Sangre, directed by Luis, Luis Ospina. Ospina. Uh, Pura Sangre. Carlos. Blood, directed by Luis Ospina. Carne uh, de Mayolo. Um, um, flesh of Your Flesh. Uh, Carne de tu Carne, directed by Carlos Mayolo, and... Y la mansión de Araucaima. And the Ara Arauca Araucaima mansion, la mansión de, Arauca de Araucaima, directed by Carlos Mayolo. Uh, so those are three films that people who are interested in Andres's work and on H.P. Lovecraft's influence on Andres's work and on El Grupo de Cali's work, would be very interested in seeing. I myself recommend those two, those three. And um, uh, regarding literary works, um, Jorge talks about a, a novel that was published after Andres died because the only, the only novel that was published during his lifetime was uh, Que Viva La Musica 
the novel that he received the day that he killed himself. Um, so Noche Sin Fortuna is the most gothic of Andres's work and is what is called an unfinished novel edited after his death by his friends, um, Sandro Romero and Luis Ospina and is the most gothic and the most horrific of them all. <laughs> oh, perfect, thank you for that. Um, and que, que Viva La Musica in English was changed to Live Forever, is that correct? That's right. Exactly, and it's a beautiful translation, gorgeous translation, so I recommend it. Okay, I'm definitely putting that on my list. <laughs> um, can can both of you or either one of you talk a little more about the cinema club? Um, and then Andres also made a like a magazine or a a newspaper called Ojo al Cine. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, what are you telling me that I should I should tell this story? Um, and Andres was a, a complete cinephile. Uh, he knew so much about movies. That's another thing that I would like to ask the energy that is around uh, Andres's energy. How in the world he knew so much about movies at a time when knowing so much about movies was quite difficult, even watching a movie was quite difficult, you know? I mean, people who are not my age uh, would have a difficult time understanding that in order for a person to watch a movie, you had to wait those three days that the movie was shown in your city to watch it. And if the movie left, that was the end of it. You know, I mean, you had to travel to another city to watch it. And Andres was known to do that, you know, I mean, to take a bus and go to Bogota in order to watch a movie. But people who are used to the internet or who are used to the streaming would find it quite bizarre. So this, we have a young cinephile, Andres, knowing so much about movies, and deciding at the age of, let's see, in April of 71, Andres was not even 20 years old. He was 19 years old. And he decides to create a cine club in Cali, Colombia, when there were other cine clubs, but not like the one that Andres was thinking. And I mean, I have always described Andres' love for the movies, like the movies for Andres were his religion, you know? The movies were basically, um, they created in him the same passion that for a missionary, religion has. Andres, Andres wanted to convert people to the movies, to become cinephiles. That was what Andres wanted to do. And that's why he created the cine club himself. He created the idea. He began to gather his few good friends and he created El Cine Club de Cali in April of 1971. And the first movie that they showed was a movie by Godard. How in the world, you know, I mean, people knew so little about Godard at that time in Colombia, but that's how he began educating people about movies. And he did that from 1971 to 1977, uh, six years in which basically Andres dedicated his life to the cine club and to write about movies uh, and to write a magazine, five magazines he managed to um, produce called Ojo al Cine. You better pay attention to the movies. Mucho Ojo al Cine. You better pay attention to the movies. So it's it's just fascinating from a, from a cinephile point of view to imagine what he was able to create. And that that missionary work 
produce great converts, you know? I mean, there's so many people who continued uh, making movies in Colombia because of Andres Caicedo, you know, because they read what he wrote about movies and became complete cinephiles. That's and movie makers. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That is story is just is just a, a short story unto itself. Uh huh. And that's um, you can see a parallel between Andres and Lovecraft. Exactly. By the way, by the way, they created kind of a circle of other creators that then were inspired, exactly. encouraged them to make the art as well, and they carried it on. That's wonderful. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, so for for the the cinema cinema club or the cine club, um, um, uh, like the friends that he had with him, like he also you mentioned in the documentary that he or one of his friends mentioned that he taught a class and there was only three people allowed in the class. <laughs> uh, well, three people <laughs> became interested in going okay. to the class. <laughs> 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 the, way, the way it was described in the documentary makes it sound much more exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> they quite exclusive, but you know, I mean, those were the three students <laughs> that he had. Okay. Oh my gosh, that's, a, that's fantastic. Um, I think that a lot of the documentary now speaks for itself, but is there anything else that you would like to say? Um, about the film or about Andres um, or any message you'd like to give our audience? No, yo creo que hay como una justicia poética de que la película se esté presentando en el H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. Eh, creo que se cierra un ciclo para Andrés muy bonito de entrar en, entrar en conexión, en diálogo de alguna manera con... con con esa película que él quería hacer eh, sobre Lovecraft, ¿no? Sobre eh, la sombra sobre Innsmouth. Entonces, sí. solo eso quisiera decir, ¿no? Como que gracias por la invitación, gracias por el espacio y, y gracias a, 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 a la justicia poética por, por, por poder conectarnos. Um, um, Jorge basically says that if there's a lot of poetic justice uh, when you think of uh, this documentary, Balada para Niños Muertos, um, the song of dead children being shown at a festival that has the name of H.P. Lovecraft, because that's what Andres would have loved, you know? I mean, he was one of his heroes. He had many heroes, but he really was very interested in, in the description of the horror, how he described, how H.P. Lovecraft described the horror of life in a way. And, uh, and, and, and Jorge feels that that is really wonderful that the film is being shown there and he feels very uh, thankful and honored that, uh, that you brought the film uh, to be shown at the H.P. Lovecraft Festival. And um, um, I would like to say that um, I am um, incredibly thankful to Jorge for um, the desire that he had and the passion that he exhibited uh, in wanting to know so much about Andres. And there's also poetic justice there in the fact that we met, you know, and that just as pure, as pure coincidence that I began to tell Jorge uh, things about our family that I felt that was that uh, facts about our family that I felt had influenced Andres and Jorge didn't know, for instance, about my, our dead brothers. You know, I mean the the shadow of those. I mean, talking about the shadow of Brain's mouth. You know, I mean the shadow of those dead babies um, in the house. And uh, I felt incredibly thankful to Jorge for his sensitivity and love 
of Andres's work. And that's why he was able to create um, such a good documentary. And I, because of that, because of who Jorge is as a filmmaker and as a person, I felt very comfortable showing him um, parts of Andres's soul in a way and my own personal archives on, on Andres. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much for joining us and like talking, yeah. taking the time out of your day to talk to me about the documentary. Um, Jorge, where can people find more about your other films and your documentary and more information about you as a filmmaker? Um, my, my, las, mis películas están para movie en Latinoamérica y en Amazon Prime también. Eh, una se llama La Sangre y la Lluvia, Blood and Rain, y la otra se llama We Are the Heat, Somos Calentura. Eh, pero creo que en Estados Unidos no se pueden ver. Eh, creo que somos la sangre, la lluvia, Blood and Rain, sí se puede ver en Amazon en Estados Unidos. Okay. Uh, uh, two of his movies can be shown on Amazon pre, uh, Prime and uh, Movie, uh, but um, he thinks that the only one that can be seen in the United States is La Sangre y la Lluvia, uh, the blood and blood and rain, uh, which can be uh, can be seen on Amazon Prime. Okay. And um, Rosario, you are a on jury for you're on you have been on juries for film festivals. Yes, yes, I have. Yes, yes, I I am a cinephile myself. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I love I love movies. I think that. Uh, um, Andres and I watch movies since we were very, very little together. That was one of the bonds that we had. <laughs> so it's a very nice. Um, and do you have other works that pertain to um, art and film? Well, I have written two books. I I have written a memoir and I have written um, a, a book of poems. So, okay. and I have actually published them just uh, in the last two years. So I feel very, even though I've always, I've always, um, I have always written things. Uh, it took me to the age of 72 to publish my first book, 70, 72. And then at 73, I published the other book. So I feel, I feel very, very happy with that. Okay. And, and where can people find your memoir and your book of poetry? Uh, you, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, the, uh, the memoir that is called Mil Pedazos, 1,000 Pieces, um, can be bought on Amazon. It's in Spanish, and it is uh, published by Planeta Libros, uh, by Planeta, that's the publishing house. And the other, my book of poems, which was just launched in the book fair in Cali, is called Las Vidas de Mis Muertes, The Lives of My Deaths. Uh, and uh, it can be found on Amazon too. So um, so I, I, I felt very, uh, uh, very happy that I was able to do that. And I have to say that it was through in a way, I have never said this to Jorge, but um, when uh, when we were working on on the film, when Jorge came to my house, uh, that is another thing that I'm incredibly thankful for to Jorge for that he sort of brought the movie, he brought movies into my house, you know, brought the film, the magic of a film, into my house, and I felt incredibly happy for that. Uh, um, and uh, I think that I really began to consider seriously publishing a memoir that I had been writing for many, many years uh, while Jorge was here. So in yeah. a way, it's sort yeah. of combined with that. It was a very sort of intense experience. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so your brother... Yeah. 
or Jorge, you, it's like the whole circle. Yes, <laughs> it, 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 really shows, it really shows how art can unite people, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and can create a wonderful bond and you, you sort of create a family, you know, or at least I feel that way, you know, I, I have, yeah, yes. it, it's just something that I just feel like uh, Jorge, I, I call him my adoptive son, you know. <laughs> 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 well we, we call our our film festival when we have to describe it to people it's kind of a it's a film festival but it's a family reunion and also a uh like a retreat for creatives because we have filmmakers and writers and artists and attendees all come together and we talk about the films we talk about lovecraft we talk about our work and Sometimes there's really great collaborations that happen after the festival because people meet each other and then they like their ideas and then they go create something new and it's a whole cycle and it's it's wonderful. <laughs> it is really it is really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, um, and it really it really shows the the power of art. You know those incredible connections, the personal co connections that if you're lucky, you develop. Yes, definitely. Okay, I think I'm gonna wrap up so our audience can go on to the next film. Um, but I wanna thank Jorge Navas and Rosario Casero for taking time out of their day to talk to me. It was so nice to meet you. Um, I hope we have a chance to see more work from both of you. And um, thank yeah, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for the invitation. Really wonderful. It's, it, I, I feel very honored just talking to you.